Hello, and thanks for reviewing the following presentation given during the 2020 Data Science Symposium webinar series. The Data Science Symposium is one of several services provided by the University of Cincinnati's Center for Business Analytics, a part of the Lindner College of Business. Through leadership forums, student projects, public education events, including the Data Science Symposium and the Analytics Summit this spring, as well as professional development courses, the Center provides businesses and organizations with game-changing capabilities to drive analytics for competitive advantage, regardless of size or type of organization you represent. For more information about the Center, including how to join our 25 member organizations and the benefits they enjoy, please contact either myself or Dr. Michael Fry here at UC. Now, enjoy the following presentation. First up is Jason Ponting. Jason, are you there? I am, Glenn. Good there you are. Afternoon. Uh, good, good afternoon to you, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, to the Data Science Symposium. Um, where uh, where are you sitting to, uh, today? What town? I'm are you sitting in? in Boston in my library, about twelve minutes walk from the MIT campus, where uh, I worked for many years. Excellent. Staying, staying in touch with the, uh, the old digs there. Um, so, so Jason's a contributing writer to Wired and a senior advisor at Flagship Pioneering. Uh, he leads the enterprise's thought leadership and publishing and uh, advises its companies. Uh, Jason was formerly the editor-in-chief and publisher of MIT Technology Review. Uh, he's written for numerous national and international magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, the Economist, the Financial Times, and the Boston Globe. He's also a frequent television and radio guest expert. So, Jason, uh, you're going to talk about where all this technology is headed and particularly where data science technologies are helping to solve a myriad number of problems really not previously solvable. Um, you want to give us a little, uh, little quick uh, overview before you launch into your presentation? Yeah. Um... I will try and tell the audience about the most important technologies that they have to worry about over the next five years, how they're impacting both investment and business practices, and some of the areas that concern me a little bit, that I worry about uh, when I think about both the beneficial uh, and the challenges of new technologies. Yeah, there's there's a uh, there's excitement in terms of what the capabilities are and the technology, but also uh, perhaps some ethical um, and uh, and social considerations that have to be taken into consideration. Glenn, there always are. These technologies have enormous power, but they're morally neutral, and they can be used for good or ill, depending on how we choose. Excellent, excellent. Well, great. Well, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't like being long-winded. I'd like to give, uh, give our speakers as much mic time as possible. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it on over to you. Uh, and to the audience, uh, remember, don't forget you can ask questions uh, at any time during Jason's presentation. Uh, we'll, we, we won't be answering them during the presentation, but we'll be queuing them up to field a Q&A session following. So now let me uh, let me shut down my screen share here so I can turn it back on over to you. And Thanks, Glenn. Let's see, where am I? Give me a second here. There we go. All right. Over I'm going to share my screen now. One second where I move all your pretty faces out of the way. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk today about the future impacts of new technologies. And though Glenn gave me a very nice introduction, uh, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit um, about who I am. There we go. Forgive me. So uh, as I was saying, I'm a senior advisor and partner at Flagship Pioneering. 
Flagship Pioneering is a venture capital firm in Boston that mostly invests in life sciences, both in therapeutics and also in agriculture. But I'm also a venture partner at another venture capital firm called Social Impact Capital, where I was the lead investor in two recent companies this year, one called Totus Medicines and the other called Menton.ai, that use precisely the types of machine learning techniques that I'll be talking about uh, today. For many years, I was the editor-in-chief and publisher of MIT Technology Review, uh, and I also helped found and fund MIT's open innovation platform, which is called Solve. Uh, MIT believes it doesn't have all the solutions to the world's problems, and every year it suggests five grand challenges that it doesn't know how to fix itself, and it invites people from all over the world to come and propose their solutions on the hypothesis that if MIT, say, cares about distance learning, there may be a young headmistress in Soweto who knows more about it than they do. Uh, I've done a number of things over the years, but what I like about science and technology, what excites me about it, both in my former career as a journalist and now as an investor, is I like the capacity of technology to solve really big problems. Um, it often seems to me that we have a vanishing runway to solve many things that directly impact ordinary people, whether it's climate change or sustainability or the generation of clean technology solutions for pressing diseases. Um, and science and technology can be a kind of Switzerland where we can come together to solve those big problems. There may always be policy arguments about the type of future uh, that we want, but we can at least come together to go and propose better solutions. Today, I'm going to talk about seven technology trends in data science that I think the audience will be confronting uh, over the next five to 10 years, but they're technologies that are in development right now or are being used currently. I'm going to have the same structure for all seven technology trends that I take you through. There'll be five takeaways. I'm going to talk about what the technology is. I'm going to say who is developing it. I'm going to talk about how it works very briefly. Uh, if you're more interested in the question and answer period, I can direct you to papers or uh, key influences other than myself. I'm going to tell you why you should care uh, at all, what we get from this new technology. Uh, and then finally, uh, because I used to get this all the time as a science writer and a technology editor, I'd be asked when we can expect this thing. Uh, is it in current use now? And some of the technologies I'll be describing today are uh, in development as we speak. Some of them are creating new products, and some of them may be a few years from broad scale use. And then finally, if I'm a direct in investor in a company or uh, flagship is, I'm going to declare my interest so that you know that though I am genuinely excited by the technology, uh, I have some kind of financial stake. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we're going to leave maybe 50 minutes at the end where you can uh, pester me with questions and tell me what I've forgotten. So the first technology I want to talk about today is active learning or radical empiricism. I, I've stolen the phrase radical empiricism from the philosopher William James, but I came across it through a partner at another venture capital fund called Lux Capital, who's been using it to describe a, a new technique in machine learning, essentially AI-controlled experiments for closed loop learning. Uh, this means building out scientific labs or other sources of real world data, and then training the algorithms on that data 
in a iterative and continuous fashion in order to create new models and new experiments. Um, there are a bunch of companies working in this space, Lab Genius, Recursion, Incitro, uh, Accentia, Generate, and Celerity, but this is pretty brand new stuff. None of these companies are more than eight years old. Uh, the oldest is uh, Accentia, uh, but most of these companies are even newer than that. Than that. Lab Genius was founded in 2018, Generate and Celerity over the last two years uh, as well. It's a simple idea, essentially. These companies are creating empirical computation machines that combine machine learning and AI, but direct robotic automation and human scientists in order to recursively and intelligently search through a design space. What you get from this is a kind of combinatorial power and a, a fundamentally new way of doing science. Of all the trends I'm going to show you today, I think this is potentially the most important. So rather than leaving the best for last, uh, I'm beginning with the one that I think will have the largest impact. What do you get from this? Well, if you want to be transactional about it, you get new proteins, especially new therapeutics. You get other stuff like new materials. But fundamentally, what you get is a new way of doing science. Using this technique, a company like Lab Genius can do literally trillions of experiments in a single 27 month period. And crucially, the science isn't constrained by hypotheses that human beings themselves will think up. And, and that matters because it turns out that human beings were only good at plucking the low hanging fruit of science. We were good at things like suggesting the, the central dogma for DNA, but for complex systems like social sciences, like business decision-making, like biology, it turns out that human beings are not particularly good at understanding difficult experiments. They're not particularly good at suggesting radically new approaches, and they also have a limited bandwidth to conduct experiments. Using this technique, we can fundamentally change the scale of science that we're doing. This is one of these breakthroughs that it's difficult at the moment to really suggest what its, its final uh, terminus is going to be. It is happening right now. It has a number of advantages uh, beyond this revolution in science. In addition to uh, uh, accelerating science, it also increases the uh, the accuracy and the products uh, are emerging right now. Uh, Incentia has a clinical trial that it's doing right now uh, for manic depression, but you should expect to see new products over the next two to five years in this space. I should declare a slight interest. Uh, Flagship created two companies working in this space called Generate and uh, Celerity. But I think this will be a fundamental change uh, throughout machine learning. My second trend for the day is graph neural networks. It turns out that the conventional uh, neural networks used by deep learning, convolutional neural nets, can't handle graph data. Graph data uh, describes the relationship between objects in the world. And lots of learning tasks, and perhaps all the important ones that we really care about in the human world contain rich relational information or unstructured data. Now, the people working on this are uh, extremely smart and they have devised a 
new computational model that captures the interdependence of a set of objects on a graph. Companies like Google, DeepMind, Microsoft, and UCS are, are working on this. It is at the very edge of my understanding of mathematics, but its, its impact is fairly straightforward. Each node in a graphical GNN pulls the embedding from its neighbors. It calculates the sum, it passes it along to a new embedding, and ultimately creates a master embedding for the entire graph, capturing all the relationships in a network that you are trying to describe. You get out of this predictive models for really complex emergent properties, uh, for traffic, for social science, for business outcomes, and for uh, relationships that cannot be understood by human beings otherwise like protein to protein interactions. Google and DeepMind improved the accuracy of estimated times of arrival in Google Maps by 50% over the last 18 months by using these graph neural networks. So there are real world benefits from using this technique that you will never achieve through conventional deep learning. When is it emerging? Well, we've had graph theory for you know, 100 years, one way or another, and adapting it to uh, existing convolutional neural nets is mathematically difficult, but not impossible. And these techniques are emerging as we speak. <clears throat> transfer learning for drug design. Um, so transfer learning uh, isn't new. It's been around for around 12 years, but a moment where I catch my, my breath, but applying machine learning, bioinformatics and supercomputing to drug discovery is a brand new thing. And it was used this year in a remarkable experiment by uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So what they did is in just 22 days, using the uh, known SARS-2 sequence, which had been published, and the known antibody structures for SARS-1, they generated 20 mutations that created working antibodies that interrupted the action of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So uh, this is um, absolutely a remarkable breakthrough. Um, Traditionally, as many of us have learned during the pandemic, it can take a decade or so to develop a new vaccine. This isn't a new vaccine or even a conventional uh, antiviral. Instead, it, it harnesses the fundamental mechanism of how COVID-19 works in order to interrupt the basic protein functions of it. And they did it in no time at all. So this happened this year. You can read the paper uh, on BioArchive. If you want to see how machine learning and data science is being applied in a golden age today to emerging new fields, uh, I, I urge you to look at this paper by the Lawrence Livermore National Labs. It is a model of creativity and science. These uh, 20 mutations are being tested as we speak uh, in vivo, uh, and I'm hopeful that at least one of them will move into clinical trials and uh, help us uh, begin to live with the disease. Um, I should then mention AI is also working on a COVID-19 uh, spike protein inhibitor, but um, I'll talk at the end about their technique and you'll see why it's going to take uh, uh, a lot longer. So new AI chips. So these are custom ASIC and software stacks for machine learning and analytics. Other companies that are working on them include Cerebra Systems, Xilinx, and a number of other companies. Uh, they look uh, a little bit like that. 
these aren't on the face of it apparently new things. They're a evolution of an existing technology uh, called field programmable uh, gate arrays. But these AI chips can adaptively reconfigure data flows uh, to become convolution engines that accelerate machine learning as part of their workload. We care about this because the same chip architectures can be optimized for different tasks in machine learning, uh, for uh, database queries, for data comprehension, and for a variety of other functions. I care about this because machine learning and data science can't just be a kind of an academic exercise. We care about this stuff because the, the bottleneck in machine learning is often the sprawl and the cost of data. And the crisis for ordinary businesses is turning that data into value for their customers. Now, industries are being turned upside down. And if the path needs to be from data to information to value, we need to be able to perform operations on the data and train our algorithms in hours um, immediately and close to the edge rather than over many months to go and make the data uh, usable. Uh, this stuff is hard engineering and it's been emerging since 2019, but the development of an entirely new architecture separate from the von Neumann architectures that we have been using during the last digital revolution, I think is both um, in one sense a predictable uh, outcome of the machine learning and data science revolution, but necessary as well. We need a computing architecture that is commensurate with the data science revolution. My next trend I think may be counterintuitive to uh, many people who have been following data sciences and machine learning and have bought into the uh, belief that all this compute and storage needs to be done in the cloud. Uh, I, I'm sure that's wrong and I'm sure that it's wrong not just in the internet of things. Generally we need to bring computation and data storage much closer to the location where it's needed in order to improve response time, save bandwidth, and manage latency. Uh, all the large uh, companies working uh, in information services are investing in this. Uh, most remarkably for me, Fastly, uh, whose stock increased 278% in 2020, uh, just by beginning to offer this type of edge computing to its customers. Um, the methodology is fairly simple, very large data sets. Uh, instead of sending them to the cloud where a command is uh, executed, rather than doing that, which is largely untenable, the processing analysis and storage is performed locally on a device or on a, a server at the edge of the network. Uh, there's a schematic of it. Uh, the information is being passed around. Why do we care about this? Well, uh, there are types of experiments, particularly the types of experiments I began talking about, like active learning, where you're performing trillions of operations where you want the information to be as close uh, to the device as possible. And passing them backwards and forwards would simply be impossible in order to achieve the, the effects that we were, were hoping for. When is it emerging? All these companies are investing in this right now. Uh, I expect edge computing to be a revolt uh, against the uh, investment in uh, cloud that we have been witnessing for the last uh, 15 years. Federated learning. So this is, this is dear to my heart. Federating pools training strategies without exchanging uh, data samples. Uh, 
bunch of companies are working this in the biology space, Alkin, uh, but also in information services, Google. We care about this because predictive models need to be trained on heterogeneous data. The more data and the more varied data we have, the better outcomes we have uh, and uh, the better outputs. But sharing data runs into issues of privacy and protection. And, and not just in life sciences and healthcare with HIPAA, uh, but also with GPDR and uh, just a growing desire of consumers to know where their data is and how it's being used. Using federated learning, a federation of systems, hence its name, can train algorithms by exchanging parameters without actually exchanging the data itself. Why do we care about this? Well, it allows institutions like hospitals or companies to retain control and governance over their data and also have an unforgeable record of how the data was used, but they still gain the benefits of training their models on very large global data sets. This is you know, tremendously important in the field of healthcare. It's not just women and men who respond very differently uh, to drugs, but different national populations uh, uh, and different ethnic populations uh, can respond profoundly differently to therapeutics. What we want are uh, training sets that can take uh, a global view, perhaps involving billions of patients uh, or in other fields, billions of customers, and yet we want the data to be private and not centralized. Again, this is a technology that is emerging now uh, and that I think is going to be uh, profoundly important for both assuring our customers that we are responsible members of the innovation economy, but yet truly living up to the, the hopes of the data science revolution. This is my last trend and it's the most science fictional of everything I'm going to talk about today. Quantum computing is a method for measuring, simulating, and actuating the subatomic world, the quantum mechanical world that spookily sits under reality uh, and is sometimes contradictory to all our assumptions about how, uh, how uh, the natural world should work. Uh, there's a quantum computer, a quantum computer by Rigetti. These rigs are tremendously expensive. The companies who have been investing in this field like D-Wave, Rigetti, SciQuantum, uh, Google and others have been investing billions of dollars a year in this for a while. The idea itself goes back to the uh, mid uh, 1980s when the great physicist Richard Feynman proposed that we could harness a fundamental principle of reality, supposition and entanglement to create an alternative to conventional digital bits. Digital bits must be either ones or zeros, or they can be um, a nothing. Qubits, by contrast, can be ones and zeros and everything in between. And that provides us with a kind of spooky parallelism where problems that could not be solved in polynomial time, i.e all the time in the universe might become theoretically possible. These problems aren't, um, they're not academic. They involve common problems that uh, businesses encounter every day, like the traveling salesman problem, but they also involve fundamental scientific problems like uh, protein folding. What you would get out of quantum computing if it was real, would be the 
potential of creating entirely new stuff that didn't exist in, in nature. We actually don't know how important a breakthrough this would be if it could be done. In fact, the, the largest prize uh, in quantum, in, in conventional computer science, a million dollar prize, uh, asked what problems are theoretically insoluble at all and what problems could be solved by a device like a quantum computer. I said this was the most science fictional thing that I'm going to talk about today. Um, if I, you ask me when will it arrive, I'm not sure. There was a fundamental breakthrough uh, this year when Google achieved what is called quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy is when a quantum computer uh, can outperform a conventional computer and vitally perform an action that a conventional computer could never perform. So Google did that this year, uh, and then uh, it published a paper in quantum chemistry to show the kind of stuff which, which they're doing. Uh, I am an investor uh, in the space. Menton.ai is creating novel peptides and proteins using the design ability of D-Wave computers, and then using conventional machine learning to uh, down filter uh, to which of those proteins might have the greatest therapeutic effect. If you asked me to choose a technology that was as if aliens uh, had descended from uh, heaven and given us a tool before we really understood them, uh, I would select two technologies. One would be this, quantum computing, and the other would be our ability to uh, edit genes. The impact of quantum computing is going to be uh, literally incalculable, uh, and it will be so for the field we all work in, data science. So um, the maths of this stuff can be tough, but uh, I urge you to keep up with it. The company that I am most excited about at a practical level is called Psy Quantum, which is being funded out of a firm called Playground uh, in Palo Alto, which claims that it will have a quantum computer with 400 functional qubits sometime in the next two to three years. Uh, and to give you some idea of the power of that, we can model a macromolecule, a protein with around 90 qubits. At the moment, Google is uh, fielding around 70. So we are, we are this close to a, uh, one of those breakthroughs analogous to the invention of the integrated circuit in the 50s and 60s or the invention of the World Wide Web and the Internet. Let me, let me conclude just by talking about some some problems in data science that, that I, I worry about all the time. And, and then, then we'll have a conversation about some of these technologies. At the beginning, I said that, that science was morally neutral. Um, well, that technology is morally neutral. Science is an absolute good, but technology is good or bad, depending on how we use it. And uh, I am astonished every day by the power of data science to solve the types of big problems that I care about. But I, I worry about a few things. I worry, first of all, whether or not we will understand the outputs from data science. As these machines become more powerful, as we train them on larger training sets, and as they begin to use techniques like active learning and federated learning, they have become black boxes, mysterious machines, um, which whose, whose outputs we could not explain necessarily if we wanted to. I also worry about biases. Uh, 20 years ago, if you asked working scientists uh, about machine learning, they would say, well, 
our data sets are very small and they are befuddled, occluded by biases. And 20 years later, they tell you that our data sets are very large, but they continue to go and represent the, the human emphases of the people who collect the data uh, and the economic interests of the people who uh, assemble the training sets. This matters for practical reasons. If we apply these techniques um, to predictive policing, to insurance, uh, and we don't fairly collect data from truly heterogeneous data sets, we might have a, uh, a misprism about the world actually look like, looks like. And the field that I now work in, uh, biotech, we have a 97% failure rate with new drugs, largely uh, because when we put the drugs into human beings, uh, rather than the small groups of usually white men in which we, we, in which we test the drugs on, uh, in stage one clinical trials, um, they often don't work with larger populations. So having data sets that uh, at least uh, manage our biases, uh, I think is a continuing imperative for everyone who works with these, these techniques. Another problem is who will own the data? I don't think it's exactly the case that we are entering a world of data monopolies, but it's certainly true that the, the companies who can assemble the data can then apply their data and their algorithms to um, increasing fields of activity. And just for the sake of innovation, I don't want a world that is um, largely owned and managed by Microsoft, by Google, uh, by Amazon, and a few large data providers. This problem is going to be fantastically heightened by the quantum computing revolution that I was just describing. Around four or five companies are investing in these new machines. Uh, when I began talking to one of the companies I mentioned uh, and asked whether or not I could conduct an experiment uh, on their machines, the head of research at that firm said to me, Jason, we've spent billions of dollars uh, on these devices. What makes you think we're going to let you rent our machine and perform a billion dollar experiment from your point of view for a few hundred thousand dollars. So I, I worry about the, um, the ownership of the data. I worry about the ownership of the algorithms and I worry about who actually owns the boxes in the final analysis. And then um, before I conclude, I'd just like to, you know, end where I began and say, I think it's vitally important that we work on the right problems. In my business life, uh, I'm tasked with creating extraordinary returns for the limited partners who invest in the companies that uh, uh, in, uh, fund our, our ventures. But at the same time, uh, I want to work not just on things like uh, social networks. In fact, I don't want to work on that stuff at all. I want to work on big problems. How will we reduce the incidence of dementia? How will we reduce metabolic diseases like diabetes? How will we create truly efficient solar cells that can capture uh, sunlight and make it into electricity? How will we store energy at scale and dispatch it anywhere in the world? How will we create biodegradable materials? It's very easy for people who uh, work in science, technology, and data science to turn their attention to what I call adjacent innovations. Adjacent innovations have enormous value uh, for the companies they work at. But the late Steve Jobs once said to me that for a 
company to survive and certainly for society to advance, large institutions must effectively destroy themselves every 10 years by creating entirely new products that are their, their future. So uh, let me conclude by saying you can follow me uh, on Twitter, uh, at Jason underscore Ponton. Email me uh, at jponton at flagshippioneering.com if you have a great idea that you'd like me to fund or look at, or if you'd just like me to uh, talk about what you're working on. And on that note, Glenn, I will fall silent uh, and uh, end my presentation. And I'm, I'm happy to go and take, uh, take questions from everyone.